more than all others, the United States of America. Thank you. I yield back. Please, before the House, the following personal request. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Tim Bishop of New York for today, Mr. Reyes of Texas for today, and the balance of the week. Mr. Honda of California for today and for the balance of the week. Mr. Danny Davis of Illinois for today. Mr. Lucas of Oklahoma for today. And Mr. Lundgren of California for today and the balance of the week. Without objection, the requests are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Texas is recognized for oh for if the gentleman will suspend uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise without objection thank you mr. speaker today I want to congratulate the Wilkes County 11 12 year old girls all-star softball team for their amazing and record-breaking season this year they won 15 games in a row and became the first team from North Carolina to reach the World Series although they did not take the World Series title their third place finish and their victories over opponents from around the country and around the world on their journey to the semifinals prove that this is a remarkable team. Their teamwork, sportsmanship, and character served to rally the entire Wilkes County community around them and saw them through their historic run for the World Championship of Little League Softball. I want to congratulate the whole team, the coaches and the dedicated parents who helped make this season one for the record books. The Wilkes Girls All-Stars have inspired many and made their county proud. I hope to see them win their way back to the World Series again next year. I yield back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Carter, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've, uh, we've all been back in our districts in the, for the last mo a month, and we've been talking to our friends and neighbors back home about what America is truly concerned with, uh, what, we are most, what is most important in the eyes of all Americans, and that is getting America back to work. Our economy is stagnant. Uh, we are... The, this, this administration is throwing up barriers, which is, which is freezing assets because our, our, the folks that normally would invest in growth and hiring people are frightened about what's around the next corner, and they're sitting with all their money, and they're not growing. I, I met this morning with around somewhere between 12 and 14 of my neighbors and just a sit-down cup of coffee uh, where we sat around and we talked about what, the way that folks in Central Texas view what's going on with the jobs market. Well, you know, in Texas, we've been blessed. Uh, we haven't faced the kinds of unemployment numbers that other states have had. But we now are, are certainly seeing unemployment creeping up in our state also. And uh, we talked, uh, we had small businessmen and women there, and they talked about the things that concern them we have, we've, we've had meetings with bankers who've explained to us that you can look at their deposits and see that American, American local investors are sitting on the sidelines and keeping their deposits in the bank and not investing in growth and, and not ingressing, investing in capital structure, not building buildings, and certainly not hiring people. And so part of the discussion this morning from some very intelligent small business folks uh, was, we think we know why. Why do you say this is happening? <clears throat> and I was, I, the answers I got were, were answers that we hear on the floor of this house every day. 
But the one that I've been talking about now for almost a year, probably maybe even over, over a year, is the fact that we are seeing the administration doing through government regulations, which are basically laws passed by the regulators, which change the, the, the playing field for people in our economy across the board at every level. It's not done by acts of this Congress. It's done by acts of bureaucrats in the, in the Obama administration as they make rules and regulations that fits their view of the world and how they think the world should work. And these regulations regulate the drivers, the force builders of, that employ the American people. And the, many of these regulations have become such a shock to the conscience of, of people who are in business that they say, my Lord, I'm not about to get invested in growth until I know whether I'm going to even have a business once the regulators are through with me. Uh, we, and then sitting on the sideline is the giant regulator uh, uh, program, which is the health care bill that we passed last year. This House passed last year and the Senate passed. We call it Obamacare. It's 2,000 pages are multiplying very rapidly as the, as the regulators, the people who are able to pass rules to, to set up the regulations that govern that bill, are imposing more and more burden on the individual employer and on those people seeking health care. So what I heard today from some people who are presidents of small businesses, run small business, uh, a, a Thomas Barrett, a very intelligent lawyer who advises, is both a financial advisor and a lawyer for small and, and other sized businesses all over Central Texas and are highly sought after for his opinion. They said it's the unknown that's driving investment off the page in the United States. It's the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen next. Are taxes, what are taxes going to do? We've got taxes that will last for a while and then go back to a different tax automatically unless this House acts. And then most importantly, and what we talked mostly about today, was all the new regulations that are coming up. In the next three or four months, the Republican leadership in this House is going to do everything it can to turn back some of the craziness that's gone on in the regulatory world. And I brought, you to, I brought the members here tonight just a few examples of some of the regulations, many of which we've been talking about all year. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the semen industry. We've talked about Boiler Mac. We've talked about a lot of other of the things we're going to talk about tonight. But it's just a general outline of, of some correction, corrective measures that this Republican-led House is going to try to, and going to pass through this body, to, to just start slowing down and changing the direction of, of what we think are some ill-conceived regulations by the executive branch, the Obama administration. And we're, I want to start off with this, this poster right here, which just tells you a small example of what we're talking about. In July of this summer, this is just what we've called the regulatory summer. These are regulations that have been proposed by various agencies. Uh, many of them are household words like the Environmental Protection Agency, but there's plenty of others. The Labor Department, uh, you can go on and on. That in July, 229 proposed regulations were, came went into effect, 379 final regulations, and the cost estimated of these proposed and final regulations over $9.5 billion to the economy in the month of July. That meant business, the job creators, <clears throat> took a hickey of $9.5 billion in one month, the month of July 2011. We just finished August. 270 proposed regulations, 347 final regulations, over $8.2 billion in August. So for this summer, just July and August, the two-month total, $17.7 billion in cost to the people who create jobs. Now, is it any wonder that the people who create jobs 
are sitting on the sideline and saying, holy cow, how do I hire somebody? And, you know, it's, it, I think the American people know why, we hire, why people in business hire somebody. They hire somebody because they think that person will make their business more prosperous, will make it work more efficiently, will make it do the job the business was set up to do. If you are in a roofing business and you put roofs on houses, you hire more roofers because you think you will be able to produce a better quality product faster and more efficiently, therefore enhancing the profit that those who have invested their capital and labor into that, pro that business, they can make a profit so that that business can thrive. You don't hire roofers when you don't need to put roofs on a house. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And everybody with any kind of common sense knows that. Now, if you've got a person who's got some business, whether it be big or small, and they, they literally don't know what the government is going to do to them tomorrow, or let's just say in the next two months, following this track record, they could be looking at another almost $20 billion worth of additional cost to their business that could be coming up in September and October. Based upon the last two months, it's arguable that it's pretty close to $20 billion of additional cost that they were not anticipating and never thought was going to happen to them, and all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, it drops in their lap. Now, you'll hear arguments, wait a minute, many of these things are environmental in other ways, and people have known all along something about this is going to be done, and that may or may not be true, but what the ramifications of what the regulators actually did are turning out to be a horrendous cost to industries that right now are trying to get the ground under them stable so they can start hiring people again. It, until, if, you're, if you're on balancing ground, sort of like this earthquake we had up here in Washington, which I am very fortunate that I wasn't in, uh, when that ground's unstable, you don't know which way to turn. Well, the same thing goes for business. When the, when the foundation underneath your business is unstable, you don't know which way to turn. Are you going to go out and hire somebody? And give them a job when this is what your life is right now and someone is creating that problem they're actually by their actions making it unstable and I would argue the questionable regulations the imposition of additional costs the the unknown of what taxes are going to do tomorrow all these things create an unstable environment for the people who hire people so this last regulatory summer is a perfect example of the earthquake that has shaken the foundation of the small businessman and the job creators in America. <clears throat> the President of the United States promised us, the White House promised us to save ten billion dollars in red tape, which that's one of the kind of slang words for bureaucratic uh, regulations in five years. But the White House has put forward $17.7 .7 billion worth of red tape in two months. The message has been lost somewhere. Where is it? Where, when, did, when did what we were promised change into a, into a three for one uh, worse situation then, then we were promised a $5 billion savings for, for the job creators. And in fact, we've created a $17.7 .7 billion expense and uncertainty to the job creators. And we wonder why we are not creating jobs. Mr. Kucinich was talking about his view of the world. I, he and I don't see the world the same way. But the facts are, when he was talking about we need to create jobs, we darn sure need to create jobs. The world of Congress today is finding ways to get this country back to work. If we put this country back to work, 90% of our problems will be much, much better. So the real goal of the Republican House this year, to finish this year out, is going to be trying to correct at least some of this instability created by these regulators, these unelected regulators. These are appointed people, not elected people. The heads of these agencies are appointed by the president. 
Uh, they are under the, the wings of the White House, if you will. They are part of the executive branch of government. And the legislature, this branch, the Congress, is going to, in the next several months, try to put some reins on these out-of-control regulators and hold them back. And we've got just some of them we're not, I'm going to talk to you about that some of my colleagues are putting forward in the future. <clears throat> the week of September 12th, which is next week, I suppose, we're going to take up the Protecting Jobs from Government Interference Act by Tim Scott, that's the Tim, not Tom, of, no, of South Carolina. Now, the facts of this situation are very unusual in my way of thinking, and I think most of the people in the United States, when they heard this on the television, they said, they can't do that, can they? It seems a Boeing Corporation has a big operation up, on the, up in the Washington State area, and uh, they were wanting to build an additional plant to build whatever Boeing builds, whether it's aircraft or whatever it is, they wanted to do it in South Carolina. They have been negotiating and working in good faith with the citizens of South Carolina and the government of South Carolina. They have looked at alternative locations around the country to make a determination what is best for their business in their situation today. And they determined that they were going to build a very important plant in South Carolina. <coughs> But the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, issued a complaint against the Boeing Company for the alleged transfer of an assembly line from the Washington plant to South Carolina. Yet not one union employee at the Boeing's Puget Sound, that's the Washington plant facility, has lost his or her job as a result of the proposed South Carolina plant. Still, the NLRB is pursuing a restoration order against Boeing that would cost South Carolina thousands of jobs. These are new jobs, jobs in South Carolina and deter future investment in the United States. This is the government telling Boeing how they can run their business at the base level of you can't move unless we tell you you can move. And if you choose to go to a right-to-work state instead of a union shop state, we're going to tell you no, you can't do it. What happened to the freedom of movement that our founding fathers created in this country? I mean, part of what makes us great is if you can't prosper in Texas, you can maybe prosper in, in South Dakota. And, you are, and, and in fact, people are right now. As we talk right now, people are taking businesses from one part of the country, going to another part of the country because of maybe newly discovered resources, maybe a better work environment, maybe a more intelligent workforce, uh, maybe a better investment community, maybe op better opportunities, maybe better tax structure. But they are, and, and that's the free right of every American in seeking prosperity for their, their company and for their family to go seek these places. If we're going to tell Boeing they can't build a plant to create <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> jobs in South Carolina, <coughs> Next, they may be telling Sam Smith in Oklahoma, I'm sorry, but we need you to stay in Oklahoma. We don't want you to move to Texas, or we don't want you to move to South Carolina to go to work in the Boeing plant, which we just canceled. Is that the kind of world we have and we want this government to have? I would say no. Do we want the people of South Carolina to have 1,500 new jobs? Yes. Is anybody talking about hurting the people in Puget Sound? No. It's the issue of union membership that drove this whole thing. And we have given our states the right to choose what kind of right to work, whether they have a right to work state or they have a union state. And every state in this country has some bit difference in how they view that. And it's part of the environment that state creates to bring business into the community. What in the world is wrong with that? And when did that become Big Brother's job to tell somebody where they can and can't offer you a job. So are we now saying that the, that the people of Washington State, who I have many friends there and I love very much, I have 
don't mean to be in any way de defaming Washington State, but we've got a group of bureaucrats that are saying those are more important people than the people in South Carolina who want to work for Boeing for a good salary because the government's tell them they can't do it. Well, Tim Scott has got this bill, H.R. 2587. We're going to take it up next week, I understand, which is going to protect these jobs from this government interference. And would take the common sense step, of, and it would prevent the National Labor Relations Board from restricting where an employer can create jobs in the United States. Who would have ever thought we would have had to even address this on the floor of the House? This world we have lived in, in fact, President John F. Kennedy, in writing one of his dissertation papers at Harvard, came up with the term, the Great Frontier which was the whole concept of America was if you fail in one place, the great blessing of America is you can pack up and move to another place. And at one time that was the frontier. Now that frontier is in technology, that frontier is in science, that frontier is, is not just move from one place to the other, it's move from one idea to the other. And that's the greatness of America. To have the government tell you where you can and can't locate is, is an abomination to the very spirit of the American dream. This one, we need to do it right away, and we're going to do it. We hope our friends in the Senate are going to help. We have the administration's new Maximum Achievable, Te Achievable Technology Act, MAC, standards, and cross-state pollu uh, air pollution CASPAR for utility plants will af affect electricity prices for nearly all American consumers. In total, 10,000 power plants are expected to be affected. And I can't tell you the number in other states, but... Texas surprisingly fell under this act, which no one anticipated, and we actually had no input whatsoever, but that's a different argument, which I've made before. But I know that we're talking about 19, 17 to 19 plants just in Texas being closed down. These are coal-powered plants. We're talking about coal-powered plants in most instances here. <coughs> the result to middle-class America is an annual electricity bill increase in parts of the country from anywhere to 12 to 24 percent just by this one regulation that, 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 the, that has been proposed dealing with coal-powered plants and greenhouse gas emissions. Well, Representative John Sullivan of Oklahoma has come up with a solution for this. H.R. 2401, the Transport Transparency and regulatory analysis of, analysis of impacts on the nation. One of the things that we think any regulator should be looking at as he's doing this type of work is how does this impact the jobs of the American people? How does this impact the economy of the area? If you have a state that has 20 power plants and the results of your uh, mandatory and arbitrary ruling is going to shut down 12 or 15 of those plants, it doesn't take a genius to figure the price of electricity is going up. And even if they go in and make a conversion to some other form of power, at great cost and expense, billions of dollars of additional money having to be spent, even if they do that, you're still going to have downtime when electricity is going to be scarce and the risk of blackouts and brownouts is going to be increased. And quite honestly, it hurts every industry that depends on, and every person that depends on that electricity. And has anybody looked into this and said, here's how we figured this out and told us with transparency how this affects? No. So what Sullivan is trying to say is that we need to, to, to call a timeout and it would, require, it would require a cumulative economic analysis for specific environmental protection rules and specifically delay the final date for both utility MAC and CASPAR rules until full impact of the Obama administration's regulatory agenda has been studied. Some of this stuff is done with computer projections, but 
the facts are, it's a it's kind of a shock and surprise to everybody that's in the business, and it's time for we to, to call time out, and rather than cost this country jobs, give these people a chance to continue to have good jobs for the American people to work at. This is a good bill, and we're going to take this bill up, up the week of September the 19th. The next bill that this Republican Congress is going to take up is H.R. 2250 to deal with, with what's called Boiler Mac. <coughs> <coughs> From hospitals to factories, colleges, thousands of major American employers use boilers that will be impacted by the EPA's new Boiler Mac rules. These new stringent rules will impose billions of dollars in capital and compliance costs, increasing the cost of many goods and services. And you know, college kids will tell you how expensive going to university is today. They don't need any more cost increase there, but it'll call, increase the cost of public of of uh, uh, higher education, and it will put over 200,000 jobs at risk. Just what they have done under their Boiler Mac rules. So what are we to, what are we doing with HR 2250? Representative Morgan Griffin of of, of uh, Virginia has proposed this, that it's called the EPA Regulatory Relief Act, would provide a legislative stay for four interrelated rules issued by the EPA in March of this year. The legislation would also provide the EPA with at least 15 months to repropose and finalize new achievable rules that do not destroy jobs and provide employers with an extended compliance period. In other words, if it's a problem, Let's fix the problem without costing people jobs. Let's fix the problem with a reasonable amount of time for compliance so that we're, it's not a knee-jerk reaction that is required by everybody to try to keep from going out of business because of EPA-imposed rules. So basically, just like the last bill we talked about, this is saying stop this craziness, take a new look, let the people you're regulating have some input into, into the cost and the compliance and the job loss, and then this restructure, if we've got to fix this problem, restructure it in a manner that makes common sense to keep the American men and women of this country working, keep the, the factories open and producing, and the colleges and universities opening, open and producing, and not impose a short-term heavy burden of, a, of a additional capital in, infusion in order to meet regulatory changes. Give them time, a reasonable amount of time that common sense says it would take to fix the problem instead of imposing this ram down your throat series of boiler mac rules. October the 3rd is the week the Republican Congress will be bringing that before the American people and before this House. <coughs> This is one I've been working on for quite a while, and, and we, have, we, I hope, to a part of our efforts in these these evenings that we talked about the cement Mac issue, the imposition of new regulations on greenhouse gas emissions from, for the cement factories, and the fact that we had the opportunity to very effectively drive cement production off out of this country and offshore to China, India, and maybe Mexico where they don't regulate at all the emissions, and then we think it's somehow going to fix greenhouse gases. It's kind of insane that cleaning it up over here and driving people offshore to where they don't clean it up at all is going to help anything. It's going to hurt something, but that's a different argument. <coughs> In the week of October 3rd, the cement Mac and two related rules are expected they are expected to, to affect approximately 100 cement plants in America. Their cost is estimated to be seen somewhere between three and four billion dollars for a six to eight billion dollar industry. 
Now just do the math. That's a tremendous burden if these rules are come into effect. These stringent requirements will cost, be cost prohibitive, and the American cement industry, quite frankly, could be at risk across the board. And we could wake up finding ourselves importing from other countries by necessity a product that we lead the world on. You know, concrete is the second most used building material on earth. The only thing that's used more than concrete is water. So Portland cement, which is the base ingredient of creating concrete, is as important to the building of infrastructure, buildings, uh, and basically the, everything that we live with as anything on earth. And we are in that business, and we produce cement in various states in this country. We produce the Portland cement process. And these regulations would shut down factories and, and basically cause these international companies, because all companies, whether they're based here or not, trade internationally to move someplace else. And you wonder why jobs are going overseas. Well, in this case, in the cement industry, jobs will be going out of the country for one specific reason, government regulations beyond reasonable, reasonableness. <clears throat> the cement Sector Regulatory Relief Act, sponsored by Representative Sullivan, again, my good friend from Oklahoma, will provide a legislative stay of these rules. Hold off, brother. We need to look at these things. And provide the EPA with at least 50 months to repropose and finalize new, and here's the magic word, achievable rules that do not destroy jobs and provide employers with an extended compliance period. Once again, Quit cramming it down our throat. Quit doing it, saying you've got to do it tomorrow. Give us time to implement reasonable rules. And as we look at these rules, let's analyze what they're going to cost us in the way of jobs and in the way of our economy. And take that into consideration as you plan out the reasonable step way forward. And you'll find that many of the things we're going to be taking up uh, in the next couple of months are right there is the secret key ingredient. We're going to come up with rules that you can achieve without destroying jobs that will still, over a long term, if you give time to comply, will meet the requirements that are necessary that, that people think to clean things up if they need to be cleaned up. October 3rd is when we're going to take that up. Sometime in the month of October or November, we're going to take up another bill. Oh, by the way, when you're talking about jobs that work in these, these uh, Portland cement factories, these jobs are good jobs. These are labor jobs, but they're trained labor jobs. They're good jobs. They were somewhere between sixty-five and $85,000 each. Now, that's a good American job that ought to be done by an American, not by someone from China or from India because we've driven these industries out of our country. <coughs> Coal ash. H.R. 2273, we're at the, and these are anti-infrastructure regulations commonly referred to as cold ash rules. They will cost hundreds of billions of dollars to fix, according to the existing regulations, affect everything from concrete production to building products like wallboard. The result is an estimated loss of well over 100,000 jobs. So. You know, at the end of this last month, we had no job gains. Not one job was created. That's what the report said. Well, just in the, in the things that I've read to you so far, as a result of these regulations, if all this took place next month, just the numbers that we're, we've given, we're talking about about 500,000 jobs so far that these bills that this, this Republican Congress is going to take up and, and try to get some reasonableness in this regulatory process. It's time for this Congress to not surrender the lawmaking, rulemaking is lawmaking, authority to regulators without overseeing what they're doing and make sure they're not harming our economy and harming what's going on in America and the jobs that everybody needs. 
We can't afford to lose more jobs. We've got to keep the people working that have jobs. And then we've got to, to enhance these businesses in such a way that they feel they are, that they are, are not going to be threatened by surprise regulations and therefore they're willing to say, I've got stable ground under my feet. I can start to expand. I can start to hire again. I can start to invest my capital, which right now is sitting in the bank, into, into new and better products, services, factories, etc. So this coal ash bill that will cost this country 100,000 jobs, H.R. 2273, the Coal Re Residual Reuse and Management Act, sponsored by Representative David McKinney, McKinley, I'm sorry, of West Virginia, would create an enforceable minimum standard for regulation of coal ash by the states, allowing their use in safe manner, in a safe manner to produce products and protect jobs. It's just basically saying, let the people that have this coal ash, and it's in certain states more than other places, use this coal ash and regulate this coal ash in such a manner that it does enhance the environment without destroying American jobs. Once again, the Congress has got to act, and the Republican Congress is prepared to act. <coughs> now, here comes my favorite of the crazy regulatory acts. The EPA is now proposing rules to regulate dust. Now, I live in Texas. We got one, we got more highway miles than any other state in the union. Plenty of paved roads. But we've also got what we call farm roads and ranch roads. And in the western part of those states, those farm roads are covered with, with what we call caliche, which is a, a pulverized limestone. Uh, and in the uh, over in the eastern part, it's covered with, uh, with, with certain types of gravel, some of, it, some of it river gravel and other things. And when a, when a farmer drives up to his house on his driveway, it's usually got some kind of gravel or caliche on it, and it kicks up dust. The EPA is now saying you can be, violate, you can be fined for driving home every night on your gravel road. Now, what's your solution? Well, it's easy. Go out and spend $20,000 and pave your driveway, that, that five miles of driveway. So put pavement on it. Oh, but make sure you put a certain kind of pavement because it's got to have pavement that doesn't kick up dust. And arguably, if you use asphalt, it won't kick up dust, or concrete, it won't kick up dust, or not as much. But you might kick up a little more dust if you do what they call squirt top, which is what most farm roads are, which is tar with ga gravel spread on it until that gravel sets, it kicks up dust. So even if you went to the expense to build a farm road that was a paved farm road, your paving method might kick up enough dust, dust to get them fine you and take money out of your pocket anyway. And the EPA now wants to regulate dust. California does this already. I asked one of the, my California colleagues, how do you keep from getting fined in California for having the dust regulations? And here's what they said. Water down your roads every day so it doesn't have dust. Mud's okay. Dust is bad. Okay. Now, that may be great for California. I don't know what the water situation is in California. But it hadn't rained in Texas. Some kids are, born or are about to go off to school haven't seen a rain in Texas. It hadn't rained so long. But seriously, I landed at the airport and looked out at this water falling up here on the East Coast and said, Holy cow, we don't even know what that looks like back home. Why don't they move all this water on the East Coast down to Texas, where it hadn't rained, to my knowledge, in six months? And grass is, and half of the, my neighboring county of Bastrop is burning to the ground because it's so dry and so hot, and we haven't had a rain in so long. We may be the only state in America that's praying that a hurricane will hit our coast so we can get some rain. Are you going to tell that farmer who the only way he's getting that, that water that he's feeding his animals is through shallow wells that may have gone dry on him or deep wells that he has to drill to get to additional water under the ground or windmills that are pumping that water if you're out west 
which if they're, if they're not that deep and, and there's a, lot, a lot of them have gone dry, his precious water that his livestock and his family needs to survive, he's got to take it out and squirt it on his road so he can get home at night? Now, does that make economic sense to the American people? I don't think so. But then, if you sit in the big EPA building in Washington, D.C., and have never even seen one of these roads, and probably never been outside this beltway, it may make perfect sense to that person in this paved world uh, that we live in inside the beltway. But it doesn't make sense to the average person that's trying to make a living all across this, the rural parts of the United States, and not just rural, but all across the United States where, unfortunately, we kick up dust. And by the way, plowing kicks up dust. So then you can only plow when the fields are wet. Do you ever plow when the fields are wet? Well, the only person who would sit in the EPA office and think that, that the farm products magically appear at their grocery store would know that you can't get off in a muddy field and plow effectively. Now, yeah, you can turn up some moisture at the right time. And you can keep dust down. And farmers do. They don't want their topsoil blowing away like it did in the dust bowl. They've learned their lesson about that, and they're doing the best they can. And I, and I would commend them for doing it. I went to school in Lubbock, Texas, in, back in the 1960s, at the end of what we call the dust storm era. And because of modern farming methods and so forth, they still have dust storms up there, but they're nothing like what they had in the 50s, nothing like what we had in the 60s. And I would argue that because of good modern farming methods, we keep the dust to a minimum, but we still sometimes have half the state of, of New Mexico blew through the panhandle of Texas. Now, who are you going to find? The state of New Mexico? The New Mexico farmers? The Texas farmers where it lands? Who's going to be responsible for all that dust that's out there in the air? Well, the EPA says somebody is because they've set regulations, and that would be a violation of these regulations. The biggest shortage of anything in this town is common sense. And this is the most nonsensical rule of anything that's come down. One of our new freshman congressmen, Christy Nome, this congresswoman is a smart lady. She knows rural America. She knows the ridiculousness of this set of EPA rules. She's come up with a farm dust bill, which we will take up this winter, to make EPA start using some common sense. The president was asked a question about this in one of his meetings here recently at a town hall. He sent this farmer on a bureaucratic wild goose chase, and he never got anything in return. So as a result of that, that farmer... As his efforts, which that wild goose chase produced nothing that was satisfactory. Christy Nome has H.R. 1633, which would protect American farmers and jobs by establishing a one-year prohibition against revising any national ambient air quality standards applicable to coarse particulate matter, that's dust, and limiting federal regulations of dust where it's already regulated under state and local laws. In other words, let the states take care, because let me tell you something. This is not one of those Texas brags. We had dust storms where I went to school where girls didn't wear dresses in the, in the spring because it would pick up pea gravel the size of a dime with a, a, those 60-mile-an-hour winds coming across the plains, and it would blow that gravel so hard against their bare legs if they had on dresses, it would literally cut them up as they tried to walk to class. Now, that's an act of God. That's not, nobody created that wind. And certainly, pea gavel is about as big a particulate matter that would be flying around anywhere. But the federal government doesn't control the wind, and it never will. You've got to get some reasonableness to back into what's going on. Finally, because I've been talking about this now for over a year, and, I, and, and in my office, we are tracking every regulatory agency, and, and every day we're seeing new and bizarre concepts of what we need to do from regulatory agencies. We're seeing bugs shut down major highway projects. You know, when the president laughingly said he learned that shovel-ready jobs are not really shovel-ready jobs, 
He should have gone on to tell you why many of those shovel-ready jobs weren't shovel-ready, and it was because of regulations created by the regulatory agencies that stopped legitimate road and bridge projects that were funded, and I have one in my district right now that is funded, and the dozers are on the ground ready to move, and that project is shut down by one of these many, many regulations. And it's, it's the same across the country. We, could, we can't do today what FDR did. It's great to talk about what FDR did. I don't think it, was that, that it accomplished a whole lot in getting us out of the Depression, but that's my opinion. But the facts are, you couldn't build a Hoover Dam today, just up and go out there and start building a Hoover Dam. My Lord, just to build an electric power plant the, regu the number of regulatory agencies and permits that you'd have to have would cover the walls of this chamber before you even get to break ground. I've seen those rules put <laughs> on walls. It's amazing number of rules. <coughs> we are a world of government control of everything. And that's what these regulatory acts are about. Now finally, this congressman, John Carter, because of looking at this stuff now just for the last year or so, I really and truly think the best thing we can do to give the stability to the employers who employ people is to basically ban the implementation of any new federal regulations from now through February, January, Feb, January 31st, 2013. Guarantee a two-year window for businesses to hire without any fear of new calls from regulations, and we would make exceptions, certain exceptions would be allowed for the military, or foreign affairs, or internal agency management, and personnel rules. So they'd still be able to have regulations that fit in those categories, and make, we make sure that we keep the, our foreign operations and our military operating, and they, they have to make rules to operate under. We would, we would exempt those particular things, but the rest of them would say just time out. Continue your studies, continue your discussions. I would encourage you to extend, their, to, to extend an arm out to, to business to say, this is what we're looking at, let's hear what you think. Let's start putting ourselves together with the idea of people are part of this environment too. People are really what makes up this country. Without people, we're just a barren land. And people to live need to have a job and the people who create jobs need to have a reason for hiring people and giving them a job and people who have ideas the great driving force of America the new idea you know we just got so many examples of new ideas just in the in the uh, high-tech industry and the communication industry the revolution has taken place just in the last 10 years of new ideas. Those new ideas come from the freedom to think and the, uh, the belief that you can take that idea and put it into reality without somebody stepping on your toes and preventing you from doing it. These regulations and this control from Washington to D.C., this cradle-to-grave mentality that seems to be running inside this beltway, and these creation of these regulatory rules is putting the brakes on our economy and putting fear in the hearts of American entrepreneurs, and business people, and employers who want to make their business better by hiring those good people that we're graduating from our colleges and universities, those good people that are trained and trained skills that we need to put to work in America. And we'll put them to work in real jobs not government-created jobs with borrowed money, but real jobs that, that produce something and create wealth and make us and continue to keep us the most prosperous nation on earth. It doesn't come from government. It comes from the people. The people are the wealth of this nation. Their ideas, their entrepreneurship, their investment of their own personal capital, and their willingness to take a risk on America because they know America's great. And to people who don't think we're great or think that they're smarter and can be inside this beltway and make rules that can do a better job of telling you how to run your life 
or how to drive home on your farm road, then you know, I say get out of the way. And that's what this fall is going to be about. We're going to be bringing these things up, and these are the good things that are going to be discussed and talked about and voted on this fall because we Republicans believe that the right path to create jobs and create wealth in America is to get the regulators to, to start thinking in terms of creating jobs, not destroying jobs, enhancing businesses, not negating businesses, and to put America back to work. And if we put America back to work, all the rest gets better. The debt goes down, the tax revenues go up, the, co the country has more to pay back the people we owe, which ought to be a first priority. We can get our financial house back in order. We can get our credit rating back that it was taken away from us. And we can start operating like America has always operated. The business of this country is business. And as much as that was criticized back in the, in the 20s, that statement's true today just like, like it was then. It's the American people that give the American people jobs, not the government. Let's put the brakes on these regulatory things. We're going to do that this fall. Look forward to it. Pay attention to it. Members of this House and anyone in the, around the country who has an interest, pay attention to it. Give us your input because we are bound to determine to level out and stabilize that playing field that business creates jobs on so that we can put America back to work. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for your time, and I yield back the balance of my time. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. It's a uh, great privilege to stand here on the floor of the House, even at this late hour, uh, as we prepare to hear tomorrow the President of the United States uh, come before the joint session of Congress to uh, talk about how America can get back on the right road, on the road to recovery from this uh, long recession, and how we can create jobs here in the United States. For many, many uh, months now, my colleagues and I have been here on the floor uh, and have submitted legislation time after time and week after week uh, talking about specific programs to create jobs. I want to uh, thank my colleague uh, on the Republican aisle for his presentation and the solution of doing away with regulations as the way of creating jobs. Uh, he mentioned uh, getting government out of the way and he also mentioned the uh, Hoover Dam. Um, which was built with borrowed money. Yep, they borrowed money to build the dam, and uh, it did, in fact, create jobs. Now, whether there are regulations or not, the fact was that the United States created an enormous infrastructure system in the past. And for the last decade, we've done very, very little. Uh, even though we borrowed a vast amount of money to build infrastructure projects in Iraq and Afghanistan, but precious few here in the United States. We need to bring that money back home. We need to build those infrastructure projects here. And by all expectation, tomorrow when the President stands here before us, he will be talking about infrastructure, as he should. It is the foundation upon which we build any economy 
and it's certainly the foundation upon which the American economy has been built and succeeds such as it is today. We need an infrastructure bank. We need to take money that we will borrow at about 1 or 2 percent interest rate for a 10-year note, put that money into an infrastructure bank, let's say it's $20 billion, reach out to the pension funds in my state of California, CalPERS and CalSTRS, the public pension funds, and say, here, invest in this infrastructure bank so that we can build projects in California, so that we can put in place the levees to protect us from floods. We can put in place the um, communication systems, the fiber optic cables, so that we can build the sanitation facilities, the water recycling facilities, the dams that we need for a growing population in a state that once again could be growing if we put in place the infrastructure. Nothing modest, but rather a bold program. A bold program to, be, to build America's infrastructure, to rebuild the bridges, to rebuild those facilities that are crumbling as a result of years of inattention. Infrastructure, construction jobs, putting people to work. And as the President said on a Labor Day, there are a lot of construction men and women out there that are prepared to get dirty in the job once again, to end their unemployment. That's one project that I am sure the President will be putting forth to this Congress. And the question to my Republican colleagues, are they ready to be bold? Are they ready to step forward and put America back to work or only talk about regulations and doing away with regulations? Uh, while we're talking about regulations, one of the regulations they want to do away with is one that would prevent mercury from being in our water and air. And it's as though somehow they must think that mercury is good for children and adults. We don't need more mad hatters around. What we really need is a safe, clean environment. And those are what the regulations are out there. And oh, by the way, if you want to stop all regulations, I suppose you would stop the President's effort to roll back those regulations that have no good purpose. Yes, indeed. The current administration is in the process of reviewing the regulations and eliminating rolling back and modifying those that no longer serve a good, useful purpose in protecting Americans. So, here tomorrow, we'll have the President speaking here on the floor of the Congress, talking about putting men and women back to work. We're some 250 plus days into this year, and to date, not one Republican bill has been brought to the floor that would create one job. A lot of bills have been brought to the floor that would actually eliminate tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands of jobs. What we need to do is not to address the deficit with immediate cuts that actually constrain and restrict the economy. An austerity budget is not called for as we limp along in the current economy, but rather a growth budget. Infrastructure bank being but one example. There are numerous other examples. A tax policy, a tax policy that's rational. Let me just put this all in the context for a moment of what we talk about on the Democratic side, which is jobs, putting people back to work. We can do that. And the Make It in America agenda, which I have here, is just that kind of agenda to put Americans back to work. We talked already about infrastructure, well, which is down here. It's not at the bottom of this list. It just happens to be at the bottom here. It's the number one thing that's on the agenda. We also should talk about research. Yesterday, I was in Davis, California, invited there by a biotech company that uses biotechnology to manufacture bioherbicides and biopesticides. These are naturally occurring chemical compounds found in plants and animals and bugs that actually kill bugs or kill other plants. They formulate this using research that comes out of the universities uh, in California and around the nation. That research is extraordinarily important. It's creating a whole new industry of safe, biologically derived chemicals that are safe in the environment, that actually come from the environment, and 
kill bugs in agriculture or unwanted plants. That's what we need. That's the research agenda, part of making it in America. Now, I notice that uh, joining me on the floor is my colleague and part of our East Coast, West Coast operation, uh, Paul Tonka from the state of New York. Earlier today, uh, Paul and I were talking here on the floor as we were voting, and he was showing me some pictures of the devastation that has occurred in his part of New York State. And out of that conversation came once again the word infrastructure. Mr. Tonko, I'm very sorry about what's happened in your district in New England and, and here on the East Coast. We've had our disasters in California in the past, not this year, and we're thankful for that. We, our hearts reach out to uh, you and your constituents as they go about rebuilding, and I think you were saying even today there may be another flood. Paul Tonko, right. representative from the state of New York, thank you for joining us well, this evening. Thank you, Representative Garamendi, for uh, bringing us together on